Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kentucky Small Business Development Center's weekly webinar. I'm really glad you took time out of your busy day to join me. I'm Dave Edkin. I'm the director of the SBDC Center here in Louisville, Kentucky. And if everybody kind of comes and joins in, I'd like to take a few minutes uh, to share some information about the Kentucky SBDC program. The Kentucky Small Business Development Center is a statewide, nationally accredited program providing the professional expertise, tools, and information necessary for entrepreneurs to start, fund, and grow their businesses. We do this at no cost, thanks to the U.S. Small Business Administration, the University of Kentucky, as well as regional universities, college, colleges, and local economic development agencies. To learn more, visit us at KentuckySBDC.com, and there you'll find additional resources to help you start, fund, and grow your business. To request personal assistance, give us an email at info at KentuckySBDC.com, or give us a call at 1-888-414-7232. And if you look to the right of your screen, you'll find the chat feature. So as we go along, if you have any questions for our presenter, you can post them there and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. And as always, just to test that everything's working and you can hear me loud and clear, just go ahead and uh, do me a favor and say hello and tell me where you're joining us from. Be happy to say hello to everybody. Uh, and there's Robert. <laughs> Robert it's just, just me. It out. It myself. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Dave Eck. I'm the director of the Louisville Center here. I'm one of 17 centers uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And as always, a recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you this afternoon. There's Tammy and James joining. And there's Stephen. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? Good to see you. And Debbie from Litchfield. And we have one from Lexington, Russellville, Shelbyville. All right. Looks like lots of folks popping in here. Princeton, West Virginia. Joseph, how are you? Uh, Shannon? Hey, Shannon. Good to see you. Yeah. Well, today we've got a great guest, Robert Johnstone, uh, who is a podcasting expert. And um, we, we did a little bit on podcasts about six, seven months ago, and I've had a lot of requests to bring some more information on that. And uh, Robert is highly recommended, uh, recommended uh, expert on podcasting, how, how to set up your podcast and um, make it a success. And so with that, I think we'll just kind of jump right in, Robert. Let's just get going and talk about uh, marketing with your podcast and how to get this going. Absolutely. Um, and again, David, thanks so much for having me on here today. Uh, it's an absolute pl pleasure to be able to speak about uh, podcasting, any opportunity I get. Um, very, very exciting stuff. And with the work we've been doing um, through podcasting over these last couple of years now, uh, we've seen some tremendous opportunities and, and just some have some really fun stories um, that our podcasters have, you know, have had through this um, platform. So before I begin a, a little bit about myself, so I'm Robert Johnstone. I'm a partner at the Wayne Media Group and the Speakeasy Podcast Network. Uh, Wayne Media Group is a holistic small business marketing company who focuses in the territories of uh, Louisville and Southern Indiana, all the way out to Lexington, E-Town, and um, couple other areas and then we also have offices up in michigan as well uh and then through our podcasting arm uh the speakeasy podcast network we have studios in multiple locations we're actually opening up the door for our third studio up near detroit michigan which is really really exciting where we take in local businesses hobbyists different types of hosts guys who already have it and girls who already have established podcasts and we help them with the um, editing, distribution, marketing, content development um, of the podcast. And then we also offer a lot of networking opportunities along with a really, really nice studio in each of our locations to record and uh, have your have your guest at, a nice place to be at. Um, before all that, I'm a University of Louisville graduate with a marketing degree. I sold newspaper ads before I got into this side of marketing. Uh, and I spent some time in the Marine Corps working on F-18s and um, doing martial arts. I'm still very active in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I have a dog named Bear. We all like dogs, so uh, he's a pretty good boy. Um, but yeah, today I'm gonna talk to you about some unique things about podcasting. We're gonna go over some of the following topics. Uh, we'll go over to where podcasting is at today and particularly how it's advantageous for even small businesses. Um, 
why you should podcast and some of the benefits and the unique benefits podcasting has that, you know, are outside of an audience growth, outside of the advertising arm, um, everything like that, and how they can really, really help you come up with some cool plans for your even small business or internal business too. And then really just some best practices for getting started. Uh, the Both the hardest and the easiest part about podcasting is getting started. So, yeah. I'll keep going forward. So let's talk a little bit about podcasting today because it's taken a drastic turn, um, you know, over the past few years when it was really created. Uh, just a little bit. If you don't know what podcasting is, it's essentially by definition um, a pre recorded audio segment that is pushed out for later release. Uh, podcasting started because when the first iPods were introduced way back in, I want to say the, you know, mid 2000s, there was that little icon on there where people could upload their own audio clips um, and then put that on a hosting platform, which is why Apple still owns a lot of that space. But today we've went from, you know, just a few hundred podcasts back in the day to now we have just over here, 850,000 active podcasts, meaning that they're recording regularly and more than 30 million podcast episodes. Uh, let's see, 55% of our U.S. population and growing has listened to a podcast and 37% of that population is listening to a podcast at least once a month. To kind of say where the 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 big industry is going, we can see that a lot of radio stations are starting to create podcasting deals where they actually have pre-recorded shows um, be part of that own radio station. iHeartMedia has taken a big part of it. But then even groups like Apple and Spotify are signing exclusive contracts um, so they can get podcasts on their platforms only, which is really, really interesting. For example, one of the most popular podcasters, Joe Rogan, um, has signed a, this, this is a little correction here because it's not disclosed, but somewhere around the upwards of a hundred million dollar contract to be exclusively on Spotify for both his podcast audio and video, um, I think for a three year contract. So good for Joe Rogan, the UFC um, announcer, fear factor host and stand up comedian who now has a significant income from podcasting, which is really, really cool. Uh, talking a little bit about what today's listeners look like educated, engaged, and successful are three words that come into mind. 45% of podcast listeners have an annual household income of more than 250000 throughout that whole um, household. These are the engaged listeners, of course. 67% of podcast audiences are made up of people between the ages of 18 and 44. Uh, it's 68% more likely for a podcast listener to have a postgraduate degree. 68% Sorry, that's a repeat right there. Uh, and a really, really interesting part, because the relationship establishment part of podcasting from the host to the listeners, uh, there's very, very good metrics for the conversion rate when it comes to advertising on a podcast and services overall, where upwards of 69% have agreed that podcast ads made them aware of new products and services. And I believe it's around that same number for how many have made purchasing decisions from those ads. So what about what's happening in the podcast business overall and also for small businesses too? Um, number one, 39% of small and medium-sized business owners regularly listen to podcasts. Um, I see you right there, Keith, cost and time to set up your own podcast and equipment needed. We'll be getting to that here in a bit. Uh, so yeah, so a lot of listeners, including myself and most entrepreneurs, they're trying to find a, a podcaster who can kind of speak to the messages of success that they um, are trying to achieve. So a lot of bi pretty big audience when it comes to business owners. Um, businesses spend more than $78 million on podcast advertising in 2020, and we're potentially looking at that climbing to the billions just by the end of this year, especially as more and more podcasts have come um, up because of COVID and a lot of those are lasting and plus the changes within the industry. Um, hosting platforms themselves are seeing a 230% year over year average growth in business-based podcasting, both small and large. Uh, and let me see. Also too, when it comes to advertising spend, this is an increasing number um, and this has almost doubled over the last couple of years, but 
for a 30 second spot on a podcast that has an average download of about 500 to a thousand dollars per or 500 to a thousand downloads per episode per month we're looking at a 22 dollar spot um, and that keeps growing and then with the locality of businesses like what we do we can even broker some bigger deals than that for a local level so if you are a small business and you are considering um, getting into podcasting, maybe you've been on one yourself, maybe you already have one, and you're trying to wonder, hey, why is this guy here talking today about the benefits of podcasting? And why should I get started? And I'm going to go over each of these time and cost, content, web traffic, and relationships as a whole. Um, also, too, I'd love if you were put in these messages, if you have been on a podcast or if you're considering starting a podcast um, or you have one of your own, you know, I'd love to see um, some information about what those shows were so I can listen to y'all. So time and money, uh, effective marketing made efficient and affordable. One of the most interesting things about podcasting and YouTube did the same thing um, really we can compare it to youtube and facebook and twitter in a lot of ways before if you wanted to be a journalist you're going to have to get with one of the main publishing companies prove your worth probably get a journalist degree um, or something similar in communications and then hopefully after some time they'll publish your information facebook and twitter has taken care of that and has given access to anybody who wants to share something same with youtube if you wanted to have some type of series or show once again you'd have to get with the news media the television stations and just hope 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 you have a reputation a good enough pitch and everything to get in there and even so after the money spent you're still not guaranteed same thing could be said with radio with podcasting if you have a message you want to get out there nobody's stopping you the only person who could be possibly stopping you is yourself um, and possibly if you move lose your voice too but uh, yeah there's no gatekeepers there's no middleman there's no boardroom that says hey are you good enough to be utilizing this space no you can go out there and get it done the simplicity of podcasting is just that it's simple take some notes find a quiet space hit record edit it afterwards and then distribute it out various different ways um, so there's a lot of simplicity behind how quickly this can be done and it's a quick turnaround too. speaking on to um, what i just mentioned that once you're done recording, put it through your hosting platform and then schedule it out for release. Uh, James, I see I do positive, positively Shelby Weekly on Spotify. Bit up 11 episodes so far. Um, that's awesome. I'm going to give that a look. Uh, and then, too, it's a huge cost saver when it comes to the marketing realm. Um, and you'll see what I'm, at, what I'm talking about that once we get into content, too. But there is not a lot of startup costs to podcasting if you just want to get into it. And even so, the equipment cost itself it's not too bad it really isn't so content generation um there's a lot of different goals that you can have with podcasts and that we'll get to in a little bit but one of the benefits that's really tremendous even if you're not necessarily looking at audience growth is the amount of content that you can generate for your small business um, as a marketing company, one of the biggest concerns that we often see when we start to work with one of those companies, because we do need to get information from the business owner, we do want to brand that company to the business, is that they just can't get out the content that they want to put it out. They can't put it on paper. They can't think of it on the spot. Um, whereas having an open forum conversation really allows you to bring some insight and turn it into an episode and pull out additional information. So... You start by developing a good topic, create a few talking points around them, record the show, and then just listen to it afterwards. You know, you'll listen and isolate and you'll track down and then you'll see you have all these snippets, these nuggets of information that can be repurposed for many, many different things. And of course, repeat. Here's a little chart I like to show people um, about just kind of, you know, actualizing that and seeing what I mean by it. But if you were to take a 15 minute podcast that has both video and audio, there's so much you can do to create new content from it. With the video, you can take out different clips from social media. Same with the audio, create some cliffhangers, get people wanting to come back, get people to engage on there. Uh, the full episode can be uploaded on your website. Um, of course, on the hosting platforms, on the distribution platforms, um, on YouTube, uh, everywhere else that you want to put it, 
your email campaigns. You can upload these video and audio clips. Um, audiograms are always good. Utilizing different quotes and images from there. A recap. We're going to talk about SEO in a bit and the benefits of transcribing a podcast, but that's all out there too. And then, of course, incorporating this with your overall marketing strategy to let people to create content and let people know what you have going on. So there's many, many different areas that you can push out a podcast to just a 15 minute podcast to break it down into months and months and months worth of social media and digital marketing content. The SEO and that, that word, let's talk about SEO search engine optimization might be curious. How is a podcast? How can a podcast help with my search engine optimization? Um, many, many different ways. Number one, is getting that transcription. Many of the hosting platforms such as Sounder, Buzzsprout, um, handful of other places, they'll take down transcriptions of your podcast for you. You can also run it through other um, third-party applications like Rev.com, and they'll give you a close to 99 to 100% accurate transcription of your podcast. Now you can upload that to your website. You can break that down into further pieces of writing and turn it into a custom blog. So now we have those keyword driven strategies on your website and everywhere else that you can share it to. Um, podcasts are incredibly shareable amongst the, the right people and you can put them through different publishers, different platforms, different links to different websites. All of the backlinks on YouTube, on your podcast um, landing page on all the platforms, those are all going to strengthen your credibility on your website. And then on top of it, since it's a scheduled release, hopefully a scheduled release, you're constantly updating your website through your podcasting. Um, Google will ver um, favor that and see that you're making those updates. So overall, this could lead to increased web traffic, um, even when some people aren't necessarily even looking at the podcast. It's a good SEO strategy based. So for local level business, this is one of my favorite things is how podcasting can build your relationships on the local level. Um, number one, authority and credibility. Um, a podcast provides a format for educating your audience and sharing your expertise in the industry. One of my favorite stories is we have a company um, who does remodeling. They're called Twin Spires Remodeling out of here in Louisville. They do a podcast called Reimagine, Redesign, Remodel. Basically within that podcast, it's the main purpose of it is to talk about their company and what they do for their customers. They don't necessarily have a huge audience goal for that because it's so hyper localized and specific. Um, but the trickle in effect from those listeners, when they listen to their podcast, they develop a relationship with the owners of that company. Um, they can see that they're being realistic about their expectations that they're going to be sharing with them at the meeting and on the podcast. And because of that, and the fact that they're one of the only remodeling companies in this area that have that for their content mix, it gives them a, a, a really cool um, authority score, so to say, um, that they have for those customers. And we've seen just from that podcast, just from those first six episodes, we've seen the turnover into $200,000 worth of new kitchens. Um, the funniest part was, is one time they showed up to a lady who listened to all their episodes during Thanksgiving. The only thing that she was upset about is the co-host wasn't there and was just a host. I found that to be really, really interesting. Uh, audience connections. Podcasts give listeners an intimate look at your business, personality, and even your personal life. Once again, one of the more um, consistent branding aspects for small business is kind of the self-branding in these local areas. People don't want to just know what your services are. Um, they want to be educated and they want to know you. Um, being on a podcast, just as the authority factor comes in, it gives individuals a a connection to you as a person. I like to say that Joe Rogan isn't a celebrity as much as he is a friend to me because I know you know what's going on in Joe Rogan's life or what's going on in Will Bear and our Tim Ferriss's life. Um, that personal connection that we have with individuals that can be built through podcasting makes it feel like there's a relationship there. One of the biggest benefits by far for podcasting for small businesses is the networking capabilities of it and the recognition. Um, and by this, I mean the following. You are able to connect to many, many people that you might not have been 
able to connect with before um, through having this platform and owning it. Uh, having guests on your podcast gives you the opportunity to expand your network, influence, and knowledge. A perfect example is we have many real estate podcasts out of um, our out of our studio. A good example would be Jeff Tanapool and Harry Borders. They do a podcast called Two Pros. Um, and what they do is they bring on different real estate agents throughout the area of Louisville and Kentucky. They give them the networking, or sorry, the marketing platform of their own podcast to be able to talk about themselves, talk about what's going on in real estate, leave them with an actual tangible piece of marketing that they can take outwards and at the same time build an incredible relationship with them. So now people are coming and closing at their office just because they've developed that relationship through their podcast, which is really, really interesting. So those are the main local benefits of podcasting. Um, there's a lot more to consider as well. So looking at there's a lot of local podcasts, even here in Louisville, Norton um, Hospital, for example, they have three internal podcasts. They have one that's structured directly towards their nurses, and they are able to create an internal communication channel through their employees okay. to strengthen those, um, strengthen those bonds and help keep up with employee retention. Uh, a lot of car manufacturers like Ford are taking the same approach. What I see happen with even some of the podcasters in our area because they are able to use this platform to become subject matter experts in their fields at a quicker pace, um, they're getting more calls than just, hey, we want to do business with you. They're getting calls like, hey, we like what you're saying about this. Would you like to come out to our business and maybe help us out in this area? A lot of industry focused podcasters end up adding a little bit of consulting into their services in the future because they've developed that trust, because they were real about their business, and because they've shown the success that people want. I think another amazing part about podcasting, let me see, do I have a question coming in? Um, amazing part about podcasting too, as I mentioned earlier, there's not necessarily any gatekeepers who are gonna prevent you from doing it. So being able to just hit record on something, um, over time, you're going to see your confidence go up, your speaking skills, your hosting skills, um, your knowledge and industry expertise in your own field. It's just going to it's going to develop along with you as you develop that show, and you're going to become more of a a you know a subject matter expert in your industry. Uh, and then, of course, we all like to talk about there is obviously a lot of advertising capabilities to bring in additional revenue from your own show. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily just have to be download based. We have podcasters who have strategic relationships, even at the start and the beginning of their podcast with some of their business partners that help them fund and create a revenue stream from their podcast and strengthen their own um, approach to it to kind of give them a one up factor already. Um, and they're willing to pay pretty good prices. We have a podcast that just started who already has a $1,000 a month sponsorship. Um, they do a little bit more. They add backlinks. Backlinks sell sometimes for some publishers around $300 a backlink. That's most likely going to be included in a podcast, and it's going to be on multiple different um, hosting platforms and distribution platforms too, on the websites, on the show notes everywhere else. So that's a good selling factor. The branding side when it comes to social media, if you have a host on there and you're able to in integrate their logos or their message in with some of those social contents, there's something else that can sell right there. So even with a podcast that has less than 500 downloads per episode, there's a good amount of revenue stream that can be created even on the front end just by having that podcast started. Okay, so I had a lot of questions for this already, um, and I really, really want to break into this for quite some time. So how do I get started? We're going to start with planning. If you want to have a successful podcast, you need to eventually and start off by developing a good plan. What is your show going to be about? Um, the format of your show. Is it going to be you? Just you? Are you going to have a co-host? Are you going to be pulling on guests? Um, are you going to do a narrative style podcast? Is it going to be a very crucially important if you're talking about live events that are happening now that you have a very quick turnaround? Um, these are very, very important questions to ask yourself when it comes to the planning of the podcast. 
I'm going to interrupt for just one second. Lisa Lee was asking, she said, can you explain what backlinks are? Um, absolutely. So what backlinks are is a connection between one website to another website. Um, you'll see this a lot with different um, different publishing um, mediums like Forbes, for example. Um, if you are able to connect your website through a link to another reputable website that also has high traffic and people are able to click through through your website, Google's going to favor that, show that there's credibility, the credibility in what you're doing, and then increase your chances of having um, showing up higher on the search results for Google. Um, let me see. Hopefully that answered your question right there. Um, I see a question. I'm not quite sure if you could uh, if you could restate that one. Um, if this uh, how long to take liquor license? Yeah, go ahead restate that. Maybe I can help you out there. Um, but hopefully that answered your question, Lisa. I'm gonna get back to this part. So one of the one of the things I think that's very important when it comes to the planning of your podcast is to make sure that you lay out all of your goals in front of you. And I think that it is important to have both short and long term goals. Um, and those goals need to align with what you're trying to do with your podcast. For example, revenue goals and audience goals should not be considered the same thing. If you're trying to immediately make money from your podcasting, you might not want to necessarily see the audience growth as a immediate factor and a tied in factor to that. You might want to see yourself as, okay, well, I'm going to try to create this podcast to support my own business through one of the areas that we talked about earlier with helping me with the content development and helping me with the search engine optimization side and helping me with the networking side. So my goal might be to get in front of as many real estate agents as I can with my podcast. Um, that way I know I can have a tangible action to say, okay, well, is this real estate agent now sending me more business to my title company or, if I were a contractor or a home flipper and I had a roofing company on, do I have a stronger relationship with that roofing company because we shared that conversation? Now, if you have audience goals, that gets tricky too. If you want to grow an audience, you need to focus more on that plan and say, hey, what is my show going to be about and how can I create the proper um, audience personas essentially for who I think and who I know is going to listen to this podcast. Um, I like to say that there's two attributes that people need to pay extra close attention to. And I would write this um, down if, if you really, really think about getting into podcasting. Um, podcast audiences, they're looking for one or two or both of these attributes. They're looking to be entertained and or they're looking to be educated. How does your podcast, is it going to do those factors? Is it going to do both of them? If you were to put on an X, Y chart, where would your podcast land? I think that that's a very, very good way you can look at developing an audience. Because once you know, if you're trying to get people to listen to for education and you have an industry specific podcast, you need to recognize that that audience might not be there to purchase your products, goods, or services that you already have established they might be looking to get your advice when it comes to consulting, right? Mm -hmm. Now, with an audience growth, you might have an advertising goal too. And it might be more entertainment based, as we mentioned. So your goal might transcend, okay, well, I want to get a bigger audience. Therefore, I can get more paid advertising, whether it's supporting national or local businesses to create the revenue stream that way. Um, just to recap on that, figure out who your audience is going to be is one of the most important steps when planning for this podcast um, and make sure that you have that written down so you can tailor your show around your audience. Um, Susan was asking, is there a place um, one can find the listings of all the podcasts in Louisville? Um, we have all of our podcasts on our website. That's speakeasynetwork.com. I'm going to put that in here real quick. Um, and I do believe that there is a, a listing out there. I'll try to find that um, before I'm done here. But a Google search can often pull that out. And you can actually, too, if you're in anything like Spotify or um, 
Apple, for example, typing in those keywords, Louisville or whatever city you may be in, will actually pull up a lot of information because of, you know, just like Google, those um, channels are keyword driven as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, back to planning. So episodes, topics, guests, once again, these need to tie into your goal of who your audience is going to be or what you're going to be doing. If you have a content type strategy, your episodes and topics, you might have shorter episodes that talk about particular aspects of your business that can develop into good repurposed content. Um, you know, your episode topics should be one of those two facts. They should inform and educate or they should entertain. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a good layout. One thing that I see a lot of people do is there's, there's obviously very various different ways that you can format your podcast, but make sure that your topics are falling in line with that format. So for example, if you have a education based podcast, that's about your industry, it probably would be good to have guests that you can bounce back and forth on about those ideas. Now, if you're going for a more storytelling approach, you might want to structure your podcast even more, write extensive notes of exactly what you're going to say and when you're going to say it. We have one podcaster who's doing a storytelling approach, and what he does is he records an interview one week. Um, then he goes and studies that interview. The next week he comes back for his recording, and he records the narrative over that video. So we can splice in two different styles, splice in some music, and then it sounds like a almost like an audio book is getting read off. And then the interviewee will chime in every once in a while with what they were talking about during that initial interview. Another very, very important thing to establish is written down rules and responsibilities of who's involved. If you're taking it on yourself, you need to have a weekly and a monthly plan for all the tasks and responsibilities that come um, along with podcasting, which could include making sure that my hosting platform is set up properly, reviewing the podcast and writing the show notes, editing it within a timely manner, making sure that I'm paying my bills for whatever platforms I'm utilizing, making sure that I do pre and post checks on all of my equipment. Um, you know, nowadays, if you're in a studio, you want to make sure that your studio is clean weekly. All these things are very, very important that you state down and you write down all the roles and responsibilities that you could possibly have, and then make sure that those are action on that reoccurring basis. And then, of course, establishing a schedule for release is another very, very important factor that you want to put into that planning phase that will keep you consistent. So I've had a few questions about what type of equipment are we going to need? What it really comes down to is your time commitment, what you can afford, and how much you want to invest into it. Um, I'll, I'll leave a pretty good example. I do a lot of mountain biking um, as of recently, over the last couple of years. When I was buying a mountain bike, I had the choice of you know, buying a $7,000 to $10,000 um bike that has, you know, dual suspension and all the bells and whistles and everything like that. Or since I wasn't sure if I was going to love it yet, I bought myself a hardtail for around a little bit less than a thousand dollars on a sale. I'm at that point now where I'm definitely going to upgrade to a hardtail. And I think that podcasting can be done in the same way. If you want to get into it yourself, don't go out there and buy the most expensive equipment, but um, also don't give yourself the worst equipment either. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier and you can, you can absolutely get on your phone and record a podcast, but your audio is going to suffer because of that. And it's going to be harder to, uh, edit that information in the back end, unless you have extremely good editing skills. So I would say find on the front end, find a reasonably priced microphone. Blue makes, uh, or Yeti makes plenty of them, um, Roadcaster makes plenty of them. Once you start getting up into the shrew type microphones, uh, then you're going to run into a little bit higher price premium equipment. But just try to find yourself a decent price microphone that's around, you know, I would say $50 to $100 to start off with. Um, and I can put together some, some good brands that you can look after too. We use Audio Technica in our studios, the SBDs. Um, believe the 2020s is what we have and those do really good they're a cardioid microphone um, and they're really really good with kind of some automatic configurations as people start to veer away from their microphone uh, this one right here is a samsung g-track pro 
It's from Best Buy. It has multiple different settings on it. This is my travel microphone. It's about $100. Um, but yes, you do need to get away from your phone and get away from your AirPod Pros, uh, your Beats, everything like that. And I would establish yourself and get yourself a good microphone to utilize. Uh, the same can be said if you are doing a podcast and you really, really want to pay attention to your audio, make sure that you get a good pair of headphones too. A mistake that people make too is they get Bluetooth headphones. I wouldn't recommend Bluetooth headphones. I would recommend going with something that's hardwired. And the reason being is because of that latency. So if you want to make something quick, um, take care. If you want to make some quick editing on that spot, then you should definitely go into a wired podcast or a, sorry, a wired pair of headphones. So third thing on there, quiet space and soundproofing. So making sure that your environment is correct for podcasting is as important as your equipment. If you are in a open area, that's going to have a lot of, or, you know, closed off area that doesn't have a lot of furniture in it. And you have a lot of echo that stuff is going to be really, really hard to, um, edit out of there. Correct. So make sure that you're paying attention to the room that you're in a smaller room with a lot in it can make a big difference. They also make different things like there's a, um, company called GIK Acoustics that makes really good soundproofing material that's artistic looking. So you can put that up on your walls. Um, I know a lot of home studios, they end up making sure that they have really heavy drapes on the windows or on the walls. All those different sound dampening tools can really prevent um, disruption within the audio of your podcast. Uh, a second thing that you want to make sure when you get your commitment to is, of course, what are you recording onto? Uh, there's a lot of good, just free software that you can use that you can even set up multiple tracks there's single track and there's multi-track single track is when everything's coming together into one channel that makes it hard to isolate a bad channel or isolate away some disturbance on one microphone so getting something you know like audacity um, that you can do a multi-track on if you have more than one microphone lets you edit those channels independently um, once you start getting really up there, you can get something like this Rodecaster Pro that we use in our studio that lets us put on four different microphone channels and then numerous other channels. I even have the capability of talking to my podcasters from that um, board as the sound engineer, tell them if they need to get closer to the microphone, share them information, and then be able to completely isolate my own sound out of there. And then if they have somebody who's, you know, let's say breathing a lot, or they're stuttering a lot, whatever it may be, having good equipment in the editing phase will allow you to um, will allow you to take care of that equipment, that that information a lot easier. Uh, Steven, you said um, what company helps with the sound dampening? I'm gonna go ahead and see if this is the proper website real quick, but it's GIK Acoustics. Let me go ahead and pull that link up. I'll put that in there um, at the end for you, but it's GIK Acoustics, um, Golf Igloo Kilo. Um, hopefully that will help. Let me see. I'm going to get James. I see that you mentioned something about Zoom, a nice podcast kit with a mixer, two mics, and headphones. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I would say if you're looking for equipment from one area that you can look up for bundled, go to Sweetwater too. Uh, sweetwater.com. They're a audio equipment group that we work with. They have a lot of good podcasting bundles for people who want to have a very, very big studio um, or, you know, just a kind of starter kit that has a couple microphones, a decent mixer board like the Zoom that you were just talking about. So Sweetwater and GIK Acoustics. All right. Um, and please, please, please keep trickling in questions that you have about equipment. I'll be happy to answer them. So and of course, the software too. Um, this isn't necessarily equipment all the time, but you need to determine what hosting platform works best for you. A hosting platform is essentially where your podcast is going to be managed out of. This is where you'll upload your um, audio files once they're completed and edited. This is where you'll um, 
input your show notes and the backlinks that we've mentioned earlier. Um, any other type of marketing um, scheduling can be in some of these hosting platforms too. And this is ultimately where you'll distribute to the various different platforms that you want to get out to, such as Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. cetera. Um, some of the best ones, one of the most popular one is Buzzsprout. The one that we really like to use is a newer one called Sounder FM. It's really good with the analytics and it has a really decent transcription service that we're able to pull from that's included in those feeds. Uh, approximate cost to get up and running. You know, as we were mentioning, there's various different levels that you get into. Um, but I would say if you are planning on, you know, starting, you could probably get a, and you want to have decent equipment, not just doing it on your, your AirPods, as we were mentioning, you could probably get started with a budget of around, um, say, two to five hundred dollars would be an appropriate budget to allocate to get the equipment if it's just yourself you can essentially cut at least 25 percent off of that if you definitely know that you're going to be pulling in guests um yeah then you can just get that one microphone uh another good thing that you can get is pay attention to the type of microphone that you have uh, because Sometimes people just buy their microphone and they might need dual purpose. Um, Blue Yeti, they make a microphone that can be switched from a cardioid style, meaning that it's just taking in this area right here to multi-directional and then even dual channel. So this one, for example, if I did want to have a guest and I only have this microphone, I can switch my settings over to, um, where is it? Yeah, omnidirectional. And now I can have an individual on the other side with me using this side of the microphone. So that's, that's really important. Let me see. I'm going to go through these questions a little bit more. And Keith, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, James, you asked again, you said, I need help with promotion. What's the best way to get my podcast out there and get people to click and listen right now. I promote on Facebook and Twitter and within the podcast itself but I just have a few listeners. All right, so the the number one thing, of course, as I mentioned, is make sure that if you're promoting to anybody that your message is, is clear that that's the audience that you wanna have listen, especially if you're looking at from that audience group. I would compare that to a Facebook ad, for example. I might be able to know my audience. I know who I want to reach, but if my copy doesn't align with what they want to view or with what their needs are, then my promotions are going to be, um, you know, not, not that great or worthless anyways. So definitely make sure one thing that's going to help you with your promotions is making sure that you have good audiences. I will always recommend Facebook advertising, um, as a paid channel to get some money out towards your, um, towards the audience that you want the, with shareability and, and well, what, with Facebook's organic reach metrics being down so low, you know, if it's on a personal page, that's one thing, but they could catch on to it. You're going to be limited for who you can get organically. So having a small paid budget on the front end is really a smart idea when it comes to promoting your podcast. If you have a solid podcast and you're willing to pay that cost to get in front of a, a larger audience. Right. And of course, too, just as we mentioned, try to define that audience. Try to define their demographics, their interest behaviors, everything about them, so you're not wasting your ad dollars either. Um, other things, too, is the self-promotion of your podcast. And I know that we've kind of moved into the marketing section, so we'll just keep on going with that. Uh, I always recommend, especially if you're a business owner, if you're sending a lot of emails, whatever it may be, is make sure that the links for your podcast, the, the images for it, they're kind of showcased on everything else that you're doing too. If you have a monthly or weekly newsletter that's going to be going out, for example, uh, make sure that your podcast has a little section in there. If you're sending out emails every single day, build the podcast link into your signature, right? Gives people another look. The value of an impression is very, very powerful. Um, if you can start doing email campaigns, the unsubscribe rate is incredibly low because you're just giving people valuable content if you're doing it right. So utilizing those features is really good too. Um, of course, if you're having guests on there, you're going to want to always, always, always push to have those guests um, 
share on their own channels too, especially if they have a bigger um, network and they're highly engageable. So always do your research on your guest and see, hey, how can I utilize this guest to help promote my own podcast? And then help them along with that process too. Um, you know, we make the mistake as individuals of expecting somebody just to, you know, say something nice about the podcast or share it. The easier you can make it for them, if you write the copy, if you share the image, if you give them the link, if you prepare everything for your guest to go ahead and share the marketing materials that they you want them to send out, it's as easy as a click for them. So that'd be a really, really good thing to do. Um, yeah, a number of other ways. Of course, just talk about your podcast with everybody that you can um, and make sure that you're consistently pushing it out there in those channels, both organically um, and both in, you know, a paid method. Uh, I, I do think a paid method is very, very important on the front end. Another really powerful place to be, especially if your podcast is, you know, highly engageable, if you're industry focused, if you're trying to become a subject matter expert, um, or if there's just a lot of topics that can be continued to talk about, is utilizing the group features on the various different um, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. If you can create a group um, on your podcast about your podcast and you can help people through those channels, now you definitely know who your audience is. Uh, there's something else too. And this is very, very, very important. It's daily targeted engagement. Remember this term, everybody. Daily targeted engagement. If you want your channel and your name and your podcast to get in front of people who might not see it otherwise and you have an idea of who those people are, make it a focused effort to not promote your podcast or your business, but to create engagement with the individuals that you want to be in front of on Facebook. If you're on LinkedIn, for example, and you have a individual that you definitely think could benefit from your podcast or you think would be a good host on your show and you're able to you know, go on their own feed, see something that's entertaining or engageable and create a conversation and provide value, most likely they're going to click on your profile. And if you have your profiles optimized too for your LinkedIn profile, for example, to say, hey, I'm Robert Johnstone. I'm also the host of the Speakeasy podcast and the Grow podcast. Here's the links. Here's the information. Here's what I talk about. When it does come time to ask that guest, hey, would you mind being on this show? Or hey, would you mind listening? They already know a little bit about what you're doing. Um, let me see. And yes, James, you asked. Um, I know there's a little bit of latency. Uh, I would definitely like to talk to you a little bit afterwards, but also as well, um, it does take time. Um, I was with Tyler Chezer, who owns a a number of companies out here. He's a real estate investor and he has a success, successful podcast that he's about 170 episodes into. It's called Elevate, right? And he is just now, since 2019, really starting to see that kind of upward trajectory of his audience base. Um, audience building is one of the hardest parts. It's the thing that you have to pay the most attention to. It's why you have to have a developed sound strategy it's why you have to keep creating content is to build that audience but it's a investment it's just like well, hopefully this is still a good example after the crazy stock market year that we've had but you know soundly it's an investment into your future um with exponential gain once you start really gaining money off of your own money then you start to see the increase once you start developing an audience over time then you start seeing an increase um, and I think that consistency is key there. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. Uh, James, I can keep on going into that more too, um, if you have more. So hopefully that covers a lot of the marketing. There's a ton of other different strategies that you can do. Uh, once again, your marketing is not going to matter if you don't have the good plan in place and you don't have good audio in place. Two things, you can have the most spectacular audio in the world you can have the most spectacular equipment. You can have a really good hosting style. You can ask have relevant topics. 
if you don't know who you want your audience to be, you're going to have a hard time getting in front of them. And then transversely, you can have a really, really good show made up, but if you're lacking in the areas of audio, in fact, 70% of podcast listeners say that audio is one of the biggest complaints. And then when you actually look at reviews of podcasts um, worldwide, you'll notice that 90% of the negative reviews have to do with audio. So having good audio is incredibly important. Um, Steve, you said that you have the Rodecaster Pro board. Um, I know that I'm not using it to its full capability. Do you know any good resources to use it better? Um, yeah, absolutely. Like Roadcaster itself, they have good Facebook groups that you can get part of. Um, we're putting together some Facebook groups over here in the local area and up in Michigan. Um, a, one that I see talk about the Roadcaster Pro a lot is a guy called Grow the Show. Um, he's mentioned it a lot. And then, of course, too, I YouTube on the Roadcaster Pro all the time. Um, it's obviously, frankly, you know, especially specifically built for podcaster. It's the best. It's the best piece of equipment that you can have right now that you can hook everything up to. And there's so many unique things that you can do with it. Um, one thing that we like to do, Steve, and this might be be good for you. Um, are you recording on your Roadcaster Pro? Or are you recording in multi track or single track? That would be a good question that I can help you out with because if you can hook your pro up to something like Audio Edition or whatever program you're using for your audio editing and you're able to record into you know both channels at the same time um, because it's a multi-track capability, that might save you some time as well. Um, and then two, pre-mapping out through Roadcasters. Um, Roadcaster guys has this really nice little feature that's set up like a soundboard where you can preload different audio clips and sounds on there. I would highly recommend using that. Awesome. And Steve, I'll look into that Riverside, but yeah, I'd love to put, I'd love to talk with you more afterwards and, you know, see if we can give you some sound advice and I can even get my um, audio engineer on that call too, because he's been really, really good with it. So awesome. Any other questions coming in for, for this section? Cool. All right. The most important part, and we've already alluded to this a little bit, is staying consistent. Um, investment, staying on schedule. Best way to raise your ROI is going to keep doing it. Um, you just have to keep recording. You have to be adaptable. You have to recognize that you're not going to be the best host at first. That's all there is to it, especially if it's something that you haven't done before and that those skills will come along just like everything else, just like a martial arts, just like riding a bike, um, just like playing the piano. The more and more you do it, the better and better you're going to get. Um, and the more and more and more you do it, especially with the networking approach, you're going to recognize these new opportunities that lay themselves in front of you. So I would also recommend being adaptable. Always review your goals and recognize that through a new opportunity, those goals might shift, right? I know, for example, uh, Jay Pitts, he has a very successful podcast out of the local area called Resource. His initial goals were to, um, from, from conversations I've heard, were to utilize this podcast, of course, to create awareness for his real estate firm and to sell more houses. And it still does that. But what he found about along the way, as it shifted, is he was getting in front of a lot more real estate agents who wanted to have the mindset of successful realtors. And then because of that, those real estate agents wanted to start working on Jay Pitt's team. So his team can, the growth of his team of the real estate agents who are working under his agency can be directly correlated to the direction that his podcast took. So awesome. Yeah. But just keep staying consistent. One thing that really helped me out in the beginning of it, um, cause I have very fearful of talking, especially recorded volume, even when a camera's on too, is I just started recording my own podcast by myself. It was basically me rambling like a madman. Nobody's ever going to get to see those. I promise you that. But that was just something that could have helped me in the front end was to just start recording, getting used to using the mic, getting used to listen to your feedback on your headphones. You don't necessarily have to release everything right away. Right. But those things can help quite a bit is just getting used to it. Um, I would also recommend highly when it comes to becoming a good host is to do your research. There's so many good videos on YouTube that, you know, talk about 
proper body language, that talk about proper conversations um, that you can create with people, that talk about how to be a good interviewee, um, and paying attention to those things, how to make your guests comfortable, how to create you know a bond right away through compliments, um, through eye contact, everything like that uh, is very, very, very important, um, and it's going to help you um, along the road uh, or help you move along the road a lot quicker than if you're just kind of winging it each month. Um, you hate your own voice, James. I see that you said you hate your own voice. Um, what's the best way to improve dictation, tone, etc.? Uh, so I actually went through an instructor course when I was in the Marine Corps. Um, and we kind of talked a lot about those levels of what you can do to improve inflection, dictation, everything like that. The first thing you got to recognize, are you the one who hates your own voice? Like, is it just you or have other people mentioned that they hate your voice too? Um, because I'm not a big fan of my voice either, but a lot of people tell me that there's not a problem to it and there's a, there's like a, a nice subtle softness to it. So I would say the first thing that you need to do is stop hating your own voice because it's probably not that bad at all. Um, but to improve those things, once again, uh, listen to your own recordings is, is as bad as that is because of the, the previous thing that you've just mentioned. But if you don't want to do that, just go on to YouTube, find some, some videos on, you know, Hey, how can I be a better speaker, public speaker, uh, and then start paying attention, writing down those notes and paying attention to what they're telling you to do. Uh, let me see. Let's see, Keith, I appreciate you. Thanks for connecting. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Um, but yeah, I'm going to see what else is on these slides. Um, so I am actually getting to this point of wrapping it up. Uh, I really, really like this quote. Um, be inspired. You need just one person to listen, get your message, and pass it on to somebody else, and you have doubled your audience. That, once again, goes into the most important part, uh, the audience growth factor. If you want to grow your audience, recognize who they are, Say something that's compelling and engageable for them. Make sure you're providing value and not just promoting your services, and you will start to see audience growth through those trajectories. It just takes time. Um, let's see. Awesome. A little bit about what we do, and then I'm going to take some questions. So speakeasy services, taking podcasts to the next level, and also to utilizing those networking approaches. Um, one thing that I found very, very, very fun um, about this company that we've created so far is out of the 15 podcasters I have here just in Louisville, we have 30 overall throughout here um, in the United States and up in Michigan because we do offer remote services too. Um, at least 10 of them have been on each other's podcast already. And I'm also being able to create dialogue with other podcasters in the area throughout the United States and then kind of network with them to help grow each other's shows, help grow my client shows and then help grow their shows as well by um, creating those relationships and those bonds with similarities between um, industry focused podcasting. So the networking approach has been really, really fun. Um, what we do, though, in particular, is we do have some really nice studios in three locations that are soundproof, have the top tier equipment that you can think of, um, have camera positions, lighting, a good green room, and then usually a good banquet room that people can kind of have many events beforehand. Uh, we master the podcast for people. We have a studio engineer in that studio that's paying attention to the levels, making adjustments, um, making sure everything's safe and sound and that recording's going smooth through redundant features that we have set up. Um, then we manage the podcast online by putting it on those hosting platforms, distributing it out to the various different places that we need to put it out to. We help our podcasters get advertisers. We also help them with their advertising and marketing direction um, and content development as well. We offer video services, and the main thing that we have is we're trying to help podcasters become great podcasters, but also let them focus on their show their hosting capabilities, um, who they want on there, and all that building so we can save them time and take care of all the technicalities of it. Uh, so I really, really appreciate everybody for coming out here. I want to open up for questions. I know that we'll have a, a little bit of latency when you hear this, but I'll, I'll give it another few minutes and, and I'll wait for some questions. Sound good, David? 
Yeah, cool. sounds awesome. <clears throat> I do have a question, uh, Robert, just hypothetically. is there, Are there industries, if I own a business, um, that may not be appropriate for podcasting? Industries that may not like, be appropriate for podcasting. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, what, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I clean sewers for a living. I'm just to throw out an example. I mean, how would I come up with content uh, for that type of, of business? Is it, is it even possible? I would say there there are definitely certain businesses that I wouldn't want to get into there. Like, let's say, for example, all of your business is done through, like, you know, manufacturing widgets, stuff like that, right? Um, big factories. They might not necessarily benefit from utilizing podcasting for networking. Um, and as you mentioned, if you are a contracted sewer cleaner, um, you know, yeah, of course, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a show. Now, what I have seen happen, though, and, and here's another good story. Um, we have a, a newer podcaster who works for a company. Um, he's newer, so I'm not going to put all of his information out there. But essentially, they offer services for vein restoration. They do surgery on varicose veins. And his job as a sales rep is to get in front of doctors and basically get referrals right so utilizing his linkedin strategy before was either hit or miss where he'd say hey i'm so and so i work for this company i'd love to save your patient's life um, and tell you more about our company and what we do and how we can help your patients to where now it's hey i'm so and so i have a podcast about medical miracles i've heard a lot about you and i've wanted to connect for a long time would you like to be on my show so you know there's a unique approach that number one helps him build those relationships with um, the people that he wants to get in front of and gives him a little bit of authority stance, um, you know, almost looking like, hey, this guy's the real deal, right? Um, so that's really beneficial. But now he can also entertain a larger audience that his doctors can get in front of by being more generalized about what the topic is about. And then on top of that, too, he can still promote the actual business that he's part of through that podcast and have trickle in audience members who actually need the services that they provide that way. Um, I know that's a little bit different from what you asked, but hopefully that that led you. No, that, right that, was, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on um, James question here. But uh, how do you actually attract advertisers once you get a little bit of traction? Uh, it. It's from a local and a national level, there's there's a few things that are important. Like, uh, and I'm going to write these down so I make sure I hit the list. Um, <laughs> and they're not in any particular order either. But once again, number one, know your audience. All right. If you have a niche audience and you can establish that those audience already have the need for those products and services, that's going to be one way to attract advertisers and leverage um, your even if it's a smaller audience over a large audience, it's more specific. Um, you know, a comparison would be influencer marketing. Um, there's a lot of influencers who have a much smaller following than like say a celebrity, but they actually generate more revenue for some companies because of how focused they, in, they are on an individual product. So that's very important is making sure that you have proper audience metrics um, to bring in front of to the leveraging table and be like, hey, even though I only have a thousand downloads per month, 50% of my people are within this industry and they could really, really benefit from the software, right? That's important. Number two, I say this all the time. One of the most, and I, I didn't get to say this in the show, but authenticity, authenticity is so, I can't say that word. You guys know what I'm saying. Um, it's so, so, so important when creating a good podcast. Um, that's people, as I mentioned, people want to know the host. They want to feel comfortable with the host. They want to develop a relationship with the host. That's why a lot of podcasts, like even Ron Burgundy's podcast, for example, weren't that successful in the grand scale of things because it was too scripted. It was too, um, you know, put together and tailored. It was too radio voicey, right? Mm -hmm. So that vulnerability, it, it's an important factor. And part of that, um, where I was leading into with this is if you're going to promote something on your podcast, I'd always recommend actually believing and living by that product. You know, that when, when you're the one who's talking about that product or service, that's going to be able to get the, the potential buyers to buy into a lot more because they know that the person they're tuning into every single week trusts that. So that's an important part. Um, leveraging, the other areas that I've mentioned and knowing that those elements um, can help you get higher ad dollars. That is 
being able to say, hey, you're going to get more than just a 30 second spot on my website, but it's also going out on this many platforms on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, Google. Um, I'll put your logo in the show clips or I'll put your backlink in the show clips. I'll put your logo on the copy or the show art for this one. I'll include you in my content strategy for the weekly release of this podcast on social media. You'll be within the emails. All these different things need to be talked about when you're talking about leveraging advertisers for your podcast and having all that to the table and having that packet put together can be really, really beneficial. Um, So yeah, the leverage of it. The other thing too, is if you have a local focus and you can pull on that data, go after local businesses. If that's, if that's the option that you're using. Um, and you know, a lot of times if you already have those relationships, they might want to see your podcast um, perform well anyways, especially mm-hmm. on the beginning end. So to summarize that, it's all about leveraging and coming up with unique ways and showing that there's more than just a 30 second spot on a podcast that might have less than, you know, 500 downloads per month in the beginning of stage. Right. So, so, so Debbie asks, uh, how could podcasts help nonprofit groups? Hey, Debbie. Oh, tremendously. Uh, we have two nonprofit groups that podcast out of our studio um, and they are getting really creative with their messaging. Um, and getting really creative with their awareness. I would say one of the mistakes on the front end that we made with podcasting for nonprofits, or I say we as in all of us, was that it was too focused on the nonprofit. Um, if Once again, if you're focusing too much on your business and your business alone, especially for something where you're trying to get donations, for example, or maybe it could be a different type of nonprofit, but I'll, I'll keep playing with that. And you can, you can ask more specific questions too. Um, you're not going to be able to build a good audience with it. But if you have a cause like cancer research or veteran care, whatever it may be, and you're able to bring stories each week um, that are unique, informative, entertaining, and educational, then you can really build out an audience. So when it is time to ask that question, like, hey, this is what we need help with. We need more donations. We're looking for people who are interested in starting chapters and new communities. We're looking to do this, 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 and this. All that can kind of be secondary in that in that mix. Um, you know, Gary V has a good marketing concept called jab, 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 right hook. Mm-hmm. If you have, you've heard of it, I'm sure a lot of yeah. people on here have... Um, I've heard that too. Like the podcast to work and work properly and to grow an audience, it can't be about your business. It has to be about what can I provide people from an educational and entertainment standpoint. The business will trickle in afterwards. Um, But nonprofits, extremely beneficial. You just, once again, have to make sure that you're focusing on the right message to get in front of the audience you want to get in front of. Then, of course, if you are able to use the relationship side of that strategy, to get the people that you want to talk to and get in front of them and then have them share your message. That's incredibly powerful too. Yeah. So Debbie's also says she needs donors and volunteers for our local food pantry. Debbie, do you have a, um, I'll, uh, hopefully we can get together later, but I'd love to chat and tell you more about, you know, learn more about the company, but uh, I need donors and volunteers for our local food pantry. Uh, yeah. Depending on the area you are, if you just talk about the city as a whole through an economic development standpoint, um, it, it's just an idea and you're able to get in front of you know local government through your podcast um, and give them a platform to speak on, but also engage with an audience around that city as almost an informative news channel, then there's a good chance you'll have some trickle-in effect and you'll also be able to make better connections through the people that you interview. Yeah. So um, Robert's contact is in the bottom of the slide there. You can just kind of jot that down. We'll send that to you a little bit later on and um, you can reach out and I know Robert can help you do that. Let's. So Steve's asking, he says, uh, I'm trying to uh, use my podcast as an intentional marketing strategy. I have not launched my podcast yet and have seven uh, guest interviews recorded. At what time would you suggest reaching out for sponsorship? I think you mentioned something earlier and missed it. Yes, Steve. So you're, you're, you have those recorded, you're getting ready for drop. You want to know what time to reach out for the sponsorship. 
a uh, couple different ways you can look at it. If you have established relationships that want to see you successful, I'd ask for that sponsorship now if you can get in front of it. Never be afraid to ask for a sponsorship. Just be confident with the message that you're pushing out there. Of course, this could be a smaller company based on that sponsorship that's trying to get a local approach that they know that they're going to get those marketing benefits from. Um, reaching out to somebody like, you know, through a podcast network like Audible, for example, or, you know, a big CRM like Hootsuite or Casper Mattress, you know, these product services might not be the ones that you want to pursue on the front end. But if you can leverage a local smaller company that you already have a relationship with, there's benefits for both of you. Number one, it shows that you're going out strong with a bang. It says, hey, my podcast is already advertised. And number two, they get to be there on the front end and be part of this new emerging field of podcasting. So if you have the connections, go ahead and ask them. Tell them what you're doing. Get them excited. <laughs> yeah. Looks like we're um, getting close to the end here. So, um, Robert, I want to thank you for all this great information. You've gotten tons of uh, kudos on the info today. Awesome. Uh, I know everybody's interested in, uh, please reach out to Robert. If you want to get started, he is the expert, can help you from start to finish. And his contact info in the bottom, and we'll send that out to you uh, later on today. Robert, I want to thank you again. And I uh, hope you'll come back again a um, few months, maybe, because I know uh, there'll be a lot of follow-up <laughs> questions sure. here. So I really appreciate that. Uh, a little heads up next week, I have Sedale Jabosky from Open Grants uh, coming next week. And he has been incredibly successful getting grants funding uh, to start and run and fund his for-profit businesses. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I know you are too. So come check that out next Wednesday. With that, uh, everyone, have a great day. Robert, thank you so much, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, my website, uh, here's how you can get a hold of me. Number one, you can call my number. It's 502-475-5333. You can email me at um, either louisville at speakeasynetwork.com or directly to my own email. It's johnstone at waynemedia.com. And also visit our websites waynemedia.com and speakeasynetwork.com to learn more information and see some of the cool local shows that we have in our um, dedicated territories. Um, and then, David, is there anywhere else I should put that information out on, on here? Or um, No, we'll, uh, okay. we'll, we'll email everything out to everybody uh, when they get the recording. So Perfect. Uh, you'll have all the information you need to reach out to you, Robert. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and thanks for yep. the great questions. I hope I was able to help some people out today. Yep. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.